Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Tim Sipomasan, and a very warm welcome uh, to you all to the Kep Envy Memorial Lecture 2017. Uh, this lecture is an annual event of the Australian Human Rights Commission, providing an opportunity for us to reflect on the state of our race relations. Tonight's lecture is the third such lecture, and it honours the memory of Kep Enderby. Kep Enderby was, uh, from 1970 to 1975, the member for the ACT and the member for Canberra in the House of Representatives, and he would later serve as a judge of the New South Wales Supreme Court. Rights and civil liberties, respected jurists, uh, Kep Enderby was also, in 1975, the Commonwealth Attorney General. As Attorney General, Enderby introduced the bill that would become the Racial Discrimination Act. A uh, quick word about the order of proceedings tonight. We are all very much looking forward to hearing from our lecturer, Dr. Jackie Huggins, AM. Uh, but just prior to Jackie's lecture, I'll be awarding my annual student prize, uh, which is for an outstanding entry in a national essay competition for students in years 10 and 11. Uh, and before we get all to that, I would now like to invite Uncle Alan Madden to offer a formal welcome to country. Thank you, Thank you. Ooh, bugger. <laughs> Thank you. Once again, my name is Alan Madden, Gadigalola. For my first song. <laughs> Only kidding you, fellas. <laughs> Someone's happy. <laughs> hey, David, and hey, son. Two apologies uh, for the terrible weather we're having outside at the moment. Sorry. <laughs> and not being able to welcome you to my country and my language, as we were forbidden to talk our language a long time ago. As we've all welcomed the countries, first and foremost, as always, to acknowledge our Aboriginal elders, all elders, past and present, and pay my respects. And to all our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander brothers and sisters, from whatever Aboriginal or island nation you may have come from, welcome to Gadigal. And to all our non-Indigenous brothers and sisters here this evening, a very warm and sincere welcome to you to Gadigal. No matter where you've come from, whether it be across the seas, across the state or across town, once again, a very warm and sincere welcome to you to Gadigal. And as I've mentioned many times before, was, is and always will be we have only three things shorter than that, coming, taxation and going. <laughs> it is an honour and pleasure to be here this evening to welcome one and all of Gadigal. Gadigal is one of 29 clans of the Eora Nation. The Eora Nation is bounded by nature's own, the Hawkesbury River to the north, the Pean to the west and George's River to the south. Three mighty rivers is the Eora Nation, and in that nation there are 29 clans, and the clans land we're on this evening is Gadigal. On behalf of members of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council and of the Gadigal Mob, once again a very warm and sincere welcome to you. There's an old saying out there. I think it's very appropriate for you, Mob, here tonight. You heard it a million times before. They say, where there's a will, there's relatives. <laughs> <laughs> so once again, on behalf of Lane Council and of the Gadigal Mob, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Uncle Ellen Madden, for that warm welcome. And I also want to acknowledge the Gadigal people 
recognition and pay my respects to elders past and present. May I acknowledge Dr. Jackie Huggins, AM, Rod Little, a co-chair of National Congress of Australia's First Peoples, the Honourable Susan Ryan, AO, former friend and colleague of the Human Rights Commission. I shouldn't say former friend, friend of the Human Rights Commission, but former colleague uh, uh, and uh, distinguished uh, guests. Uh, on the 31st of October 1975, the Racial Discrimination Act came into effect um, 42 years ago. Uh, the Act was Australia's first Commonwealth human rights and anti-discrimination legislation. It did not enjoy an easy birth. When the then Attorney General Kep Enderby introduced a bill on racial discrimination, there had been three previous unsuccessful or lapsed attempts. In 1975, Enderby's bill will pass. Today we mark the 42nd birthday of the Act, and for the past four decades, the Act has served as our society's official statement against racial discrimination and as the legislative expression of Australian multiculturalism. The spirit of the Act is one of education and aspiration. Aspiration because it is about creating the conditions for a society of harmony, respect, and unity, education because it is concerned with people resolving their differences and reaching a better understanding of each other. How to achieve such things is not easy, but it was the subject of this year's student prize competition. This is the second year we've run a national essay competition for students in which we ask students to reflect on the question of racism in Australian society. And tonight I'm delighted to announce that this year's winner of our student prize is Cooper Matangira, a year 10 student from Hunter Christian School in Mayfield, New South Wales. And Cooper is here with us. I'll ask Cooper to come up very shortly, but before, before I do, I just want to tell you a bit about her essay for the competition. She answered a question about the best way to kill ugliness and whether it involved kindness. And Cooper wrote a compelling essay. Her essay stood out in arguing that the key to educating people about racism wasn't by erasing differences, but rather by understanding differences. And I'll quote you a little bit from her essay. Many people believe that we should not see colour, but I believe that as a society it is vital that we do. Seeing colour allows us to love others for who they are on the inside and not what they look like on the outside. It teaches acceptance. Uh, Cooper, will you please come up and accept uh, the, the student prize for this year? And I want to acknowledge uh, the support of Divix because the winner of our student prize takes home a book voucher for themselves and also for their school. Cooper. Thank you, Kyoto. Cultivating acceptance and understanding remains central to the work of countering racism, and it is a perennial challenge. In 1975, when he introduced the Racial Discrimination Bill to the Federal Parliament, Kev Enderby said that there was an educative role for the law. It was about making people more aware of the evils of discrimination and the hurtful consequences of discrimination. The law is more than just about education, of course. It's also a declaration. It sets a standard for our race relations. The law signals to our society what is acceptable and what is unacceptable. It remains vital that the Racial Discrimination Act continue to set the standard. That the Act continue to express our society's rejection of racial discrimination and hatred and the resurgence of far-right elements today. The dangers of renewed prejudice and rising intolerance are real. And those of us who are concerned about racial harmony have every reason to be concerned. You will know that this year we've had further debate about the Racial Discrimination Act. 
In late 2016, a parliamentary inquiry into the Act and Freedom of Speech was announced. That inquiry concluded in February this year. In March this year, a bill was introduced to amend the Act's provisions on racial vilification. That bill was defeated in the Senate. One notable voice in the public debate about the Racial Discrimination Act was Dr Jackie Huggins, co-chair of the National Congress of Australia's First Peoples, the representative body of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in Australia. Now, Jackie is this year's lecturer. A bit about Jackie. Now, Jackie Huggins AM is a Bidjara and Birigubba Juru woman from Queensland who has worked in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs for more than 30 years. Years. She's a celebrated historian and author, and in 2001 was made a member of the Order of Australia. Throughout her career, spanning four decades, Jackie has played a leading role in reconciliation, literacy, women's issues, and social justice. Uh, no surprise, she's been a very prominent voice the last week uh, you know, on constitutional recognition, uh, an enormous issue in our public debate at the moment. Jackie holds a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Queensland and Flinders University with honours, a Diploma of Education and an Honorary Doctorate from the University of Queensland. I've had the privilege of working with, with Jackie the past few years uh, and I know that she's a respected leader, a respected advocate, someone whose voice rings with truth and power. We are proud to have her as our kept enemy, the more of a lecturer at 2017 Please welcome Dr. Jackie Huggins. Thank you, Tim. And uh, thank you all for coming. Good to see some um, new friends and old friends. Um, I wish to always uh, acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are not only the rightful owners of this continent, but who are the spiritual and inherent guardians of the living landscape. We will always be the heart and soul of Australia and I pay my respects to the traditional owners of this land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and their elders, past, present, and future. I wish to also pay my respects to Uncle Alan Madden. Thank you very much for your very kind and generous uh, welcome um, and acknowledgement to country, Uncle Alan. It's always uh, great to see you and to hear uh, your pearls of wisdom as you use that wonderful uh, Koori humour uh, to be able to, uh, uh, to carry that on. I'd also like to uh, pay my respects to Keir Enderby. That's Kep's son, who's sitting in the front row with me, and his wife, Rosemary. Lovely to see you and to meet you. And thank you, uh, Kep, for sharing your father with us in terms of uh, his work, his great work that he did. Um, unfortunately, I never met him, but uh, I've heard such great, great stories about him and what a great man he was, not only for my people, but uh, for the rest of the nation. So thank you. And I also want to congratulate Cooper for her, um, uh, her, her receiving the Student Essay Prize this evening. Uh, it's really wonderful and I'm, I'm sure that we will expect great things from you, my, uh, my dear, in the future. Whilst I know she couldn't be here tonight, I want to acknowledge the first Aboriginal woman uh, social justice commissioner, the Bunaba woman, June Oscar. And I also warmly acknowledge and salute the race discrimination commissioner, Dr. Tim, Sue Palmerson, and the dedicated and the vital work of the Australian Human Rights Commission. You do a great job. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across Australia fight every day to together 
to assert our rights and to uphold our cultures. I recognise our struggles, resilience and strength. I also acknowledge the non-Indigenous people who have stood resolutely by us, beside us, walking with us to defend our rights. People who have shared stories of the inequality we face, who have called out racism, who have protected our rights, I thank you from the bottom of my heart with our First Peoples. We must also draw on the strengths of those who have come before us. Our recently passed great champion, Dr Evelyn Scott, her father's words, if you don't think something is right, then challenge it. Keppel, Earl, Envy, QC did just that. And tonight, I honour him for that. In his third oration, in honour of the Kep Enderby oration here tonight, I am privileged to reflect on his contributions to not only the Australian legal and political systems, but also to the human rights framework upon which my people have often fiercely gripped. Kep was an accomplished and passionate Australian, committed to civil liberty and law reform. He campaigned for gay rights and abortion rights, rights, amongst other things. He was also involved in reforming the Trade Practices Act and the Family Law Act and the introduction of legal aid. While serving as head of the Serious Offenders Review Council in New South Wales between 1997 and 2000, he was outspoken against the manipulation of public hysteria about crime and the consequent rising rates of imprisonment in our country. As Attorney General for the Commonwealth, he introduced into the Parliament the bill that became the Racial Discrimination Act 1975, RDA, and came into force on this very day, October the 31st of that same year. The RDA is a foundational piece of legislation establishing Australia's identity as a nation upholding equality and tolerance with a diverse multicultural society. It is a keystone for reconciliation in Australia between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and non-Indigenous peoples. The RDA gave domestic effect to Australia's international obligations under the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. Featured prominently in the Mabo decision of the High Court in 1992 on a number of occasions. It also prevented state governments from creating laws discriminating against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. The strength of the RDA was tested recently when the coalition government attempted to remove or water down the protections provided against racial vilification, Section 18C. And has, as Tim has mentioned, uh, some of us in this room fought the good fight to have it, not to have it changed. And I congratulate all of us on that. And let's hope that it doesn't rise its head uh, for generations. However, the RDA has not always stood as an unwavering pillar of our protection. The application of the Racial Discrimination Act was suspended in the Northern Territory to allow the rollout of some elements of the intervention. The suspension of the RDA was widely criticised, including by the Law Council of Australia, which described the move as utterly unacceptable and indirect, ashamed contravention of Australia's obligations under relevant international instruments. Further, 
the United Nations Human Rights Committee stated in its 2009 report on Australia's performance under the International Declaration on Civil and Political Rights that it was particularly concerned at the negative impact of the NTER measures on the enjoyment of the rights of Indigenous peoples and at the fact that they suspend the operation of the RDA and were adopted without adequate consultation with Indigenous peoples. Tonight, I acknowledge that it has been an incredibly troubling year when we consider Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. I want to acknowledge the work of the Royal Commission into the protection and detention of children in the Northern Territory for its ability to tell stories of our children whom this country has failed. The Commission has collected the voices of most, most vulnerable and tells of their capture, imprisonment and inhumane treatment. Stories that should not exist. I respect the pain that this work brings to the surface for all involved and I honour the importance of sharing it with the broader community. We know from the work in the Lower Church Institute that racism indeed makes us sick. And yet the 2016 Australian Reconciliation Barometer found that 37% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders have experienced verbal racial abuse in the last six months. This compares with 31% in 2014. The right to be free from discrimination is recognised in Article 2 of the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, endorsed in 2009. It says, Indigenous peoples and individuals are free and equal to all other peoples and individuals and have the right to be free from any kind of discrimination in the exercise of their rights, in particular, that, that are based on their Indigenous origin or identity. For the majority of the last century, we lived under a regime which identified the colour of our skin as the licence to accept and to citizenship. The White Australia policy, other racist and destructive measures existed, including the stolen generation, the forced removal of our people from their lands, relocation of our people to reservations and missions, assimilation, stolen wages and the Northern Territory intervention, which continues to operate under the guise of the Stronger Futures policy. These policies have caused ongoing sorrow and intergenerational trauma. The destruction of land, sacred sites, cultures and languages coupled with racial discrimination have often led some of our people to feel as if their lives are worthless. These policies continue to haunt our people. As Keating reminded us all in 1992, we took the traditional lands and smashed the traditional way of life. We brought the diseases, the alcohol. We committed the murders. We took the children from their mothers. We practiced discrimination and inclusion, exclusion. It was our ignorance and our prejudice and our failure to imagine these things being done to us. The practice of discrimination and exclusion remains today. Some of our people are still kept apart from us by politics and power and forced to live away from the people who care about them the most. They are in prisons and in out of home care. As long as they exist separated from us, from their families, from their communities, and from our society, we remain a peoples who are unable to exercise the right of self-determination. We remain people who are discriminated against on the basis of race. We make up 2.8% of the Australian population, but more than 25% of the prison population. 
Imprisonment rates are even worse for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people who represent 50% of the youth prison population. 20 years ago, the Bring Them Home report was hand handed down in 1997. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children are still being removed from their homes and alarmingly at even greater rates than ever before. In 1997, SNAPE, the National Voice for Our Children, submitted to the report that the critical principle of the right of self-determination has all been but ignored and swept under the carpet in relation to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families. Disturbingly, we can utter those same words 20 years later. But tonight, I want to acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, our mothers, sisters, daughters, nurturers and leaders, who are distraught in prisons, torn away from their families and children. 90% of them have been victims of violence or sexual assault and 80% of them are mothers. 33% of the female prison population in Australia, the fastest growing, if not the world. Miss Jew was one of them, a 22-year-old Yamachi woman in prison for unpaid fines. Three days later, Miss Jew died an agonising death in police custody from injuries she sustained due to domestic violence. Three years after her death and following the coronial inquest, the Western Australian Government has still not implemented key findings made by the coroner. Months after the initiation of the Royal Commission into the Protection and Detention of Children in the Northern Territory, a 10-year-old boy was seen handcuffed to two police officers whilst on a plane from Mount Isa to Townsville, 10 years of age. Our first people continue to lose, to lose their lives alone in prison cells. Our children continue to be abused at the hands of the legal system and its institutions. I hate racial discrimination most intensely and all its manifestations. I have fought it all my life. I fight it now and I will do until the end of my days. These words belong to Nelson Mandela, but there are many among us as First Peoples and others that have spoken these words too. Let me talk about the Uluru Statement from the Heart. The Uluru Statement from the Heart is a call for a genuine representative body and treaties process. It is a call to the nation to honour the sovereignty of our people, to address the torment of our powerlessness. It spoke to the substantive constitutional change and structural reform. The Makarata Commission seeks to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth-telling about our history. It is the culmination of our agenda, the coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. National Congress of Australia's First Peoples is the voice for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia. We were bitterly disappointed by the events in Canberra last week, which dismissed the historic and comprehensive process of the Uluru Convention and the Statement. For many decades before that, with our people trying to get constitutional change. So many people have worked very hard for many years, for decades, to tackle these issues. And it felt to, to many Indigenous peoples that our aspirations were disparagingly sidelined. My organisation will continue to work with our people 
through the Uluru Statement Working Group and all political parties to ensure that a call for a Makarata Commission is honoured. We will also continue to advocate for the removal of racially discriminatory provisions still contained in the Australian Constitution. Section 51 allows the Parliament to pass laws that discriminate against any Australian on the basis of race. Section 25 contemplates the possibility that states can ban people from voting on the basis of race. Whilst these provisions exist, we as a nation are accepting racism. Senator Dodson said, freedom, peace and justice are values that are universally yearned by all Australians. Their absence in the lives of individuals, communities and nations clearly diminishes us all if we stand by and do nothing. National Congress of Australia's First Peoples advocates self-determination and the implementation of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We believe that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples should be central in decision making about our lives and our communities and in all areas including land, health, education, law, governance and economic empowerment. We promote respect for our cultures and recognition as the core of the national heritage. Despite committing itself to implementing the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples at the World Conference on Indigenous Peoples in 2014, the Australian Government has resisted adopting many international recommendations which would assist us in doing so. These legal provisions include and prevent the enactment of discriminatory laws and a plan of action for supporting our rights. The government is yet to take steps recommended by the uh, former Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Mr James Anaya, to ensure that our communities are not exploited by extractive industries and other corporations. And it has not responded to the report on Australia by the current UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Tolai Hobos, handed down earlier this year. Despite repeated calls for self-determination from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and their community, the Australian government continues to pursue paternalistic policies which prevent us from attaining self-governance. The Northern Territory intervention is one of the most recent and devastating examples of non-negotiated racist Commonwealth intervention into the lives of Aboriginal people. It was a deeply hurtful and poorly administrative attempt to label our people as shameful and it was done for political electoral gain. The continuation of the Northern Territory intervention under the new brand of the Stronger Futures policy has led to over-policing in our communities, forced participation in work for the doll schemes which pay individuals far less than the minimum wage, and the perpetration of a stigma against us. As Senator Dodson has said, no one denies the need to address the issues confronting the Aboriginal people over Australia. But the failure by government to enter into a dialogue and negotiation over the nature of the engagement with, within the Aboriginal society of the Northern Territory will be seen by Australians in the future as a model for worse practice in position of public policy and a further addition to the litany of administrative disasters that give us and gave us the stolen generation. Although the Native Title Act provides some protections for our land, Native Title has been significantly weakened through successive government policies and High Court rulings. 
past releases extinguish native title where there is a conflict of rights. And corporate and political interests regularly take precedent over our connection to land, as demonstrated <coughs> in the controversy surrounding the construction of the Hindmarsh Island Bridge in South Australia. Australia's development policies for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities continue to be assimilationist in nature. The Community Development Program has forced many individuals into forms of employment with little cultural relevance to us. Although some health and education outcomes have improved, the lack of culturally appropriate services and bilingual teaching has stymied progress in this area. The reorganisation of development funding under the Indigenous Advancement Strategy has led to the collapse of small Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations unable to engage in competitive bidding processes and the inflation of bureaucratic costs. Political parties do not rely on our vote to win elections, but perhaps they rely on the racist psyche of some members of the Australian population to use us as social experiments. The cashless debit card, which has been trialled in two locations of predominantly Aboriginal welfare recipients, is yet another example of such an experiment. The debit card repackages the worst aspects of the income management policy introduced in the Northern Territory emergency response, continued with the basic card in the Stronger Futures package and the healthy welfare card proposed by the Forest Review. The cashless debit card similarly contains and will continue to punish the majority for the problems of a few exacerbates perceptions of disempowerment and encourages discrimination by government authorities towards Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Perhaps the way forward in all of this is that we believe that Aboriginal communities do have the solutions themselves. We urge the federal government to revisit the statements made by Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull at the Closing the Gap speech to Parliament in 2016. And I quote, A few weeks after I became the Prime Minister, I crossed paths with Dr Chris Sara. I asked him what three things we could do in Indigenous policy that would truly make a difference. This is what he said. Acknowledge, embrace and celebrate the humanity of Indigenous Australians. Secondly, bring us policy approaches that nurture hope and optimism rather than entrench despair. And lastly, do things with us, not to us. We have endured decades of reports and reviews and inquiries that have captured the racist experiences of our people. Bringing them home, little children are sacred. The, there are hundreds of recommendations within these documents which are yet to be implemented. How do we bestow a future to our children with a promise that their lives won't be haunted based on their race? that they will not suffer the trauma of the mistreatment by police and politicians that their mothers, fathers, grandfathers, grandmothers have done. That their children won't fill Australians' prisons or to be ripped away from their families in unprecedented numbers. These are the questions we all must ask ourselves. And finally, I want to conclude on the words of the great Gullaroy Unipingu, our leader in Arnhem Land and for the nation. I think it's very poignant in terms of wrapping up and how we feel about society, but also what non-Indigenous people really do need to, th to think about 
in terms of their work and their quest to, um, to support us. And he said this, what Aboriginal people ask is that the modern world now makes the sacrifices necessary to give us a real future, to relax its grip on us, to let us breathe, to let us be free of the determined control exerted on us, to make us like you. And you should take a step further and recognise for us, recognise us for who we are, not what you want us to be. Let us be who we are, Aboriginal people in a modern world, and be proud of us. Acknowledge that we have survived the worst that the past has thrown at us. And we are here with our songs, our ceremonies, our land, our culture, our language, and our people, our full identity. What a gift this is that you can give and we can give you if you choose to accept us in a meaningful way. Thank you very much. Well, Jackie, what a gift you have given us this evening uh, in challenging us to look ourselves in the mirror, challenging us to do better. Um, I said in introducing you that you're a, a, a voice of truth and power and you've shown us why uh, people regard you uh, in that way. Um, you've reminded us of the enduring legacy of dispossession of First Peoples, of the experiences of systemic and structural racism that continue to blight. You've spoken eloquently about the ongoing quest for justice and self-determination uh, for First Peoples. Uh, and you remind us that sometimes uh, we, we, we do need to uh, nurture hope rather than entrench uh, despair, to borrow those words from Chris Sarah. Uh, you've reminded us too of the role of the Racial Discrimination Act in Australian uh, reconciliation, as you put it, the keystone for the reconciliation between Indigenous peoples. Uh, there is, of course, a relationship between Native Title and the Racial Discrimination uh, Act, but as you rightly point out, the Racial Discrimination Act is not uh, an unwavering pillar of protection. And on the three occasions that the Racial Discrimination Act uh, has been suspended, they have all involved uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Uh, we won't have, uh, we will continue to have that vulnerability of the law so long as there is no constitutional protection against non-racial discrimination. But nonetheless, uh, I hope that uh, everyone here tonight has taken from Jackie's lecture the importance uh, of the law in ensuring that we have some statement on equality and tolerance. And on this day, this evening, marking the 42nd anniversary of the Racial Discrimination Act uh, coming uh, in, into effect, uh, we can all redouble our efforts and resolve to eradicate racial discrimination in our society and work together towards justice for all. Uh, Jackie, if you would now uh, accept a small token of, of, of thanks uh, from the Mayor of the Commission. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, will you uh, join me in Thanking and acknowledging our Kep Enderby Memorial Lecturer for 2017, Dr. Jackie Hines.
just before we, we conclude, a, a few uh, quick words of, of, of thanks. Um, a special thank you to Kira NDB and Rosemary NDB, uh, members of the, the NDB family, for joining us tonight. Uh, there it is. It's, it's been wonderful to have your support for the last three years uh, for this lecture, and it is a lecture that uh, honours the memory of, of your father. Uh, and to everyone tonight, thank you for coming and joining us for uh, this year's KEP NDB lecture. We look forward to seeing you at next year's lecture and hopefully before then as well. Uh, our next event is, of course, our uh, Human Rights uh, Award uh, Luncheon, which is coming up on the 8th of December. Look forward to seeing you then. Thank you.